This is the third and final video in a series about the CP68 operating system. In the previous video, we had CP68 running on this machine. We were able to run a number of its commands and compare its capabilities to the Flex operating system and to CPM. Now, if you haven't watched that video yet, I'd recommend watching that first. To make it easy to find, I've put a link to that video in the information below the one you're watching right now. Now, as far as capabilities, all three operating systems were relatively similar. Uh, the fit and finish of CP68 was not as good as Flex or CPM. I pointed out a number of its inconsistencies and idiosyncrasies that kind of bothered me. But the biggest issue I had with CP68 was how miserably slow the file management system was. And of course, you felt this on every command you ran, um, as well as just the performance of a program using the disk. And that's what this video is going to be about today, is why was CP68 slow and what might have been able, what might you have been able to do about it to fix it, or the author for that matter. Um, if you were running CP68 back in the day, chances are you would have eventually given up and switched over to the Flex operating system, or possibly jump ship altogether and bought an 8080 or Z80 machine so you could run CPM. And the reason for that really wasn't capability or performance, it was the availability of software titles for your machine. With CP68, you had basically nothing other than the assembler that the author offered and then the uh, compiled basic called Struble that he offered. And they suffered from some of the same problems that CP68 did. That was about all you had to choose from. Of course, in the Flex operating system, you had a whole bunch more titles that you could choose from, including third-party software. And then over in the CPM world, it was probably 10 times the number of titles available even for Flex. And so that was a huge uh, drawing point for the 8080Z80 world was just how widely supported CPM was. But anyway, so today we're going to go ahead and dig into why CP68's file system was slow and whether or not the author could have done anything about it. CP68 and Flex share a very similar disk layout and very similar file structures. And in fact, the software that makes up the file management system is also very similar between the two operating systems. And this is in direct contrast to CPM, for which all these mechanisms were done in a completely different manner. Now, the sectors that belong to a file and the, select, the sectors that belong in the free list on disk, those are all tracked by CP68 and Flex using linked lists. And those linked lists are done using the sectors that are on the disk, just allocating four bytes for the link information, as you see here. This is a five sector file in this illustration, and four bytes of each sector are used to point to the next sector and the next sector until you get to the end where that forward pointer is zero, as you see here, to indicate end of file. Now the free list on disk is the exact same thing. In fact, when you initialize the disk, the entire disk is link sector by sector from track one all the way through the end to form that initial free list. Um, track zero is reserved for the operating system, includes the bootloader, a pointer to the free list in one of the sectors, and the directory is down there as well. For programs doing file I.O., none of this disk structure or sector structure is exposed. Instead, files are abstracted as a byte stream. Programs read and write the entire file just one byte at a time, making a call to the operating system for each and every byte that it wants to read or write. Now, as you can imagine, this could potentially be a bottleneck if that code in the operating system is not written in a very efficient manner. And in the end, what you find is that uh, Flex did have a bit of a bottleneck there. In fact, it was its limiting factor in its performance. And CP68, it didn't have a bottleneck. It really had a complete traffic jam. Now let's take a look at that. Here we see the load time of some medium-sized programs, about 7 to 8K, on equivalent hardware systems with the same disk drives, but running three different operating systems. So for example, to load a 59-sector program on CP68, it takes about 16 and a half seconds, about 280 milliseconds for each sector. On Flex, a similar-sized program takes about 6 seconds if you divide it out it's 113 milliseconds per sector. And then on the CPM that we have running, we can load a 8K program in under two seconds. So it's about 30 milliseconds per uh, sector. So as you can see, we have flex is about twice as fast, a little better than CP68. And then this CPM we have here is almost 10 times faster than CP68, still four times faster than flex. So why is there such a big difference between them? What we're looking at here is this track on CP68. 
we have the 18 physical sectors that you see here labeled 1 through 18. Those are 128 bytes each. On top of the line are the logical sectors. This is the interleaving done to provide processing time between logical sectors. This helps reduce rotational latency. So you can see physical sector 1 matches up with logical sector 1, but logical sector 2 is in the 6th physical position. Logical sector 3 is in the 11th physical position. This is an interleave of 5. And what it does is it gives us four sector times to process the data after we've gotten sector one in, for example, and then be ready to issue the read for logical sector two. And so the CP68 designer assumed that he could get his sector processed and handed one byte at a time off to the calling program within 44 milliseconds. And frankly, it was doable. But as we see here, it took much longer than that. It took 140 milliseconds to do it. So by the time he's ready to read the next sector, sector two is not coming up. It's gone way past that. It's sector four is next, but it's still looking for two. So basically the disk has to turn a full revolution, which is 200 milliseconds, and then another 44 milliseconds until sector two is coming up. In reality, had he done no interleaving at all, it would have been a more efficient layout, although still pretty bad. Now, interestingly, even on his own system, which was an 8-inch drive, his interleave was completely wrong as well. And I, I don't understand how he could not have noticed the issues that he had with this. Now Flex used a very similar track layout, but its interleave was 6, so it actually had 55.5 milliseconds in between logical sectors, and it actually was able to complete its processing in that amount of time, so it didn't slip revolutions. So using an interleave of 6, and not slipping revolutions, we see that that was about a two and a half fold improvement over what CP68 was doing, slipping these revolutions all the time. So why is CP68 so slow? Why does it take 140 milliseconds to do what Flex is doing in 50 milliseconds? Well, one of the main reasons is because the author created new instructions for the 6800 using a software interrupt to jump in and execute these instructions and yet he treated them as if they were native instructions in the processor. Here we see several of them. We have transfer register X to A and B, transfer A and B to X, exchange X and A and B, push X, pull X, all very useful instructions. However, they don't execute in just a few cycles like a normal instruction. Each of these enhanced instructions takes about 40 instructions, not cycles, 40 instructions to run. And yet he treated them as if they ran just like a native instruction in the processor. In almost all cases, you're better off just using the processor as it was designed. Uh, you might argue that if it was not in a tight loop or anything, then maybe it made the code clearer, but half the time it didn't make code clearer either. But the biggest problem is he would use these instructions in the middle of loops that were moving data, for example. And instead of taking 20 cycles per loop, it would be taking two or three hundred cycles per loop because he insisted on using his enhanced instruction set. So let's take a look at just one example of the type of code I'm talking about. Here we're going to initialize a file control block to do a sector read. This is a routine inside the operating system. So we've come in with A, we're coming into this routine with a track in A and a sector in B. And over here on the left is the code that I would have written just using normal 6800 code. So we store A into the track spot in the file control block. We store B into the sector spot in the FCB. Then we load X with a pointer to our buffer and we store that into the pointer, buffer pointer in the file control block. Now the FCB is initialized. We load X with a pointer to that and jump off to the read routine. Pretty straightforward and simple. Now over on the right is the actual code he wrote. Um, he loads X with the file control block pointer and then stores the track and sector into the file control block using index addressing. No problem with that, that's fine. Um, and then he uses one of his instructions, the software interrupt is executing the transfer X to AB. So what he's doing is saving um, the FCB pointer in A and B. Now he loads X with a pointer to the buffer to, for IO, swaps those back around so he can now store them one byte at a time into the FCB using index addressing and jumps off to the read. The only thing I can see he's accomplishing here is that he's not having to load the address of the FCB at the end by swapping these registers around. But the net effect is that that took 86 instructions and 350 cycles instead of five instructions and 22 cycles. Just night and day difference. It didn't clarify anything in my mind. In fact, it's much more confusing code. Even if those were native instructions, it's a more confusing setup. 
Um, and he does this kind of stuff all over the place. And like I said, it's actually in some of the loops where it's transferring the 128 bytes of data. So of course that makes that bottleneck just terrible. So enough of this boring talk. Let's go ahead and turn on some computers and take a look at some of these things in action on real machines. For the rest of the video, we're going to run some demonstrations on two different computer systems. One is the Southwest Technical System you see over here on the left. That's going to run CP68. And then uh, on this other system over here on the right, it's connected to this Altair 8800 down there and another couple of five and a quarter inch single density drives. And as we've demonstrated in other videos, the uh, Altair 8800 and the uh, Southwest Technical 6800 are pretty much on par of each other in terms of performance. So we have two very similar machines with very similar disk drives. Uh, the main difference we'll be looking at is how the two operating systems compare. All right, uh, let's take a look here on this disk. So let's take a look at some of the performance issues that uh, we talked about in the last video and we explained why they happened in this video. Uh, one thing you'd use a lot would be this pip command that allows you to copy files, that allows you to back up your disk, uh, doing actually an image backup even if you want. It allows you to um, list files. It's the only way you want you could list a file. It also allows you to send things in and out of serial port to and from files, which comes in kind of handy in today's world when you need to get things out to a PC, let's say. Um, the only problem is it takes a long time to run. So I'm just going to enter it here with no parameters at all and just wait for it to come up to its prompt. And this basically tells us how long it takes to load. And it's about eight seconds just to get pip up and running. Okay, there it is. So if you wanted to just list a file, so I have this hello.sm, which is a very short file. You would type pip and route that to the console and say route the hello file to the console. This would just be a type command in CPM or a list command over in um, Flex and it would come up and display it pretty quick. But here we have to wait the whole eight seconds for it to get up. And just now we finally got our, our look at that file. We go over here to the CPM system. I don't know how quickly I can switch back and forth between these. I need a smoother math mechanism. Um, we'll take a look on this disk and we've got a uh, text file and we can say type iobyte.txt and it just comes up instantly. So that feel of course is much better than the long wait we had with PIP. Now PIP is a large program but it's not giant. In fact it needs to be bigger because it has a number of shortcomings. Um, we'll talk about briefly in just a minute. But um, it's still unbearably slow, so he didn't really want to make it any bigger. So one thing that I've done here, just to demonstrate that you could certainly have made the operating system load files quicker, is I wrote a program called QPIP. Now this is not PIP at all. This is just a program that the operating system loads like any other program. It goes out and actually loads PIP the exact same way the operating system would, one byte at a time, just to prove it could be done and not end up slipping a revolution on every single sector. So when I, uh, let's go ahead and get the disk running so that we do these tests all the same. I'll run qpip.exe. And see, we're up already. So that's just a few seconds. qpip got loaded and run by CP68. qpip then went out and loaded pip.command right off the disk in the same format it's always in, proving that CP68 could load this thing in about a third the time that it is. And that avoids slipping a revolution every single time. Um, another thing that's painful about PIP is how slow it copies files. So in order to keep it simple and not too big, he doesn't uh, buffer anything in RAM at all. He just copies one sector at a time. So for example, let's copy, um, let's call it one test2.exe. Let's just copy PIP over to uh, the second drive. Okay, so we have to wait for pip to load. That takes a while. Then it'll start the copy. And as I demonstrated before, and you'll see here again, it does this one sector at a time. And now it's making the output file. So this is gonna go back and forth one F time, which is 31 times. Extremely inefficient way to do a file copy. Now, pip has a mode where it will copy the entire disk for you Instead of doing it file by file, it will do it um, track by sector by sector, track by track. It's the quickest way to back up a disk. 
Um, and the syntax on that would be pip one colon equals zero colon. If you do that, then it copies the entire disk just track by track, ignoring file structure. The problem is it sits there and it will go back and forth 35 times 18 times, whatever that is. It's a, it's a big number. It's like 700 head loads and unloads by the time it's all done. Just ridiculous. Um, and it takes five and a half minutes to do. And why that was even considered a good use for PIP, I have no idea. You could do this so much more efficiently. For example, I wrote a program called Fastback. Um, this does the exact same thing as PIP, one colon, zero colon. So this is going to back up the entire disk, copying it track by track, sector by sector. Each one of those is a track. Now it's writing the track out and verifying it. Here's more tracks. And you'll see this whole process completes in about 30 seconds. So 30 seconds to copy the entire disk, including verification, as opposed to five and a half minutes and hundreds of head loads and unloads. You might as well have made it a separate utility and just taken it out of PIP um, to begin with. It doesn't make much sense to me as to why um, that would have been left the way it was. All right, so let's take a look at something else. The assembler is a large file. It's 3B sectors long. That's uh, 59 sectors. So let's, uh, let's get the disk running. And while it's still running, I'll start the program. If I can get it typed in time. Okay. So this is the assembler and I forgot the command line parameter or I mistyped a file on the command line. You have to wait for it to finish loading. It's 16 and a half seconds to load this. It's about a 7K program. I mean, it's just ridiculous. If you just made one type out there, it's just now finished. All right, so let's go have a take a look at loading the assembler over here on this CPM. Now in this case, I wonder if I can get any closer, not really. In this case, it's actually a bigger assembler. Let's take a look here. Um, ASM.com, say stat. It's an 8K file, 64 128 byte records. That's equivalent to 66 records over on uh, CP68. So let's see how long it takes to load. So all I do is type ASM, and as soon as you see it print anything, it's loaded and running. There it is, it's loaded and running already. So less than two seconds. Zero, one thousand, one. Yeah, I mean, just a split second. This is actually loading more than the 16 and a half seconds over here on CP68. So there's no reason at all you had to live with that kind of performance because it was offering you no great feature. A lot of these things could have been fixed at least to run as fast as uh, Flex did, uh, which is basically twice as fast as you see here. Um, if you go over there and look at what we've done on CPM, that's a well-written BIOS. It's actually a track buffered BIOS. That one's running a good nine times faster than uh, we are over here on CP68. So if you walked into a machine uh, computer store that actually had these things side by side, hardware wise, they'd all be very equivalent machines, price wise, probably the same ballpark. And yet there's a 10 to one difference or a nine to one difference in performance. It would be hard to, hard to choose the slow ones. Plus the CPM machines had just a, a dramatically larger collection of software available. But not a lot of things are sold side by side like this. But anyway, so that does it for this video. CP68, similar to Flex, but a poor implementation because of some um, coding decisions that the author made and stuck with that just don't really make much sense. But uh, just an interesting part of history. And that's probably one reason CP68 didn't progress to version 1.1 or 1.5 or 2 and move on into the future. It just kind of fizzled out.